Dobrý večer, dámy a pánové. Srdečně vás vítám na dnešní velmi výjimečné přednášce, kterou prosloví náš host, profesor Michael Beckerman z New York University. Protože ta přednáška je zaznamenávána a streamována, tak já si dovolím tedy na úvod pár slov anglicky. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Michael Beckerman from New York University here. Uh, Michael Beckerman is, of course, known to musicologists, but those of you who are from other fields, or for you, just a few information. Uh, Michael Beckerman is a uh, uh, is an expert in Czech music and music of Central Europe. Uh, he published uh, several, uh, several studies on Janáček, Dvořák, Martinu and other topics. And uh, we are very happy that he could come. I would like to thank the Faculty of Arts for supporting his journey. And uh, in the following weeks, he will teach a block course at the Institute of Musicology. But today, uh, he, will, uh, he will not talk about music, or not mainly about music, but rather about more general issues uh, we are experiencing now also in the Czech Republic. And he will mediate the American the American experience with the current situation uh, at universities and at academia in general. Mike, please. Dobrý večer, přátelé a kolegové. In the US, we don't say ladies and gentlemen anymore. Děkuji vám, že jste přišli. Odpuste mi, prosím, že k vám dnes večer Mluvím anglicky, mistr český. Toto téma je v mém rodném jazyce nesmírně náročné. Obávám se, že ve vašem by bylo zcela nesrozumitelné. Doufám, že mé poznámky budou užitečné. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's wonderful to see so many people I've known for a long time. Uh, I, when I first studied Czech, it was in this building that I did it, so I'm, I'm really delighted to be back. So I'll say, my last check is na amerických universitách v roce 2023. Byla to nejlepší doba a také nejhorší doba. So the best of times and the worst of times. Well, the best of times, let's start with that, it's good news. Though we scorn university rankings as a way of demonstrating actual quality, they're not bad for reputational issues. And routinely, US universities appear in and sometimes dominate the top 25 academic institutions in the world. There are literally thousands of colleges and universities in the US, and it's a pretty successful business in the trillions. At least 80 different American universities have endowments of one billion dollars or over, with Harvard leading the pack with 53 billion, followed by Yale at 42 billion, and Princeton and Stanford tied for third with 37 billion. My own university has a mere five billion dollar endowment, but probably close to 20 billion in real estate holdings. Private universities like Harvard, University of Chicago, Stanford, Princeton, MIT, Caltech, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Duke, Yale, Columbia, and NYU continue to produce exciting work in dozens of disciplines along with public institutions like UC Berkeley, City University in New York, and the universities of Michigan, Indiana, North Carolina, and Washington. These are all sites of exciting new research in both traditional and emergent disciplines. Tenured and untenured faculty and tenure track and full-time contingent faculty have decent medical care, at least for the US, and some universities offer housing. Salaries at major research institutions can be generous, of course, 
Many college presidents make over a million dollars. Some make over five million dollars. The median salary for a full professor in the Ivy Leagues is around $200,000. When you add to this that many faculty in so-called first-tier universities have research budgets and funds for computer hardware and other things, uh, the picture can be quite rosy. The last decades have also seen a dramatic rise in interdisciplinary work in the humanities, social sciences, and the hard sciences. And while, of course, various practices have their own traditions of inquiry that cannot be easily grafted onto other areas of study, there have been many exciting synergies in fields from gender and sexuality studies to genetics and the neurosciences. And on top of this, there's a great deal of freedom at most institutions, with faculty having a lot of input on what they teach, workloads are reasonable, and there is generous leave time. The worst of times? Well, as you may know, there are daily attacks on ideals of free speech from both the right and the left. The right has made campus wokeness is there a check word for wokeness yet? Wokeness. Uh, a campaign issue, while on the other hand, some students who identify as progressive or radical claim that certain works, images, words, and opinions are hurtful and dehumanize them and should never be tolerated in the classroom. Broadly speaking, the universities have been dealing with the impact of the culture wars on academic life. Financially, there are struggles to create some parity between the class of tenured and tenure track faculty on the other, and so-called contingent faculty who don't have permanent positions, and then adjuncts who may teach only one course. Uh, and the differentials in pay uh, have led to a great deal of unhappiness and uh, labor issues, an unprecedented number of labor actions in American universities. As I speak this moment, there are probably around 20 uh, in various institutions on the heels of several long strikes at the University of California, which went on for quite some time, and Rutgers University. Institutions such as Harvard, Brown, Barnard, Princeton, and the universities of Virginia and Pennsylvania have had to acknowledge and address the historic role of slavery in their development and broad issues related to race in America, both uh, historical and present day, are inescapable on every level of the modern university. Many in the humanities and social sciences have had to deal with STEM ascendancy at their expense. One of the reasons for a turn to the practical or vocational is that the cost of a university education, particularly in private universities, is scandalously high. Uh, probably room and board and books and uh, materials and tuition are $80,000 a year or more at, at many private institutions. Um, in recent years, universities have also had to come to grips with issues around such things as colonialism on the one hand and issues of their own carbon footprint and how to do that. There is unease in many quarters around what we refer to as administrative bloat, often the doubling or tripling of university administrators, and in general, doubts about the corporate turn of the university. On top of that, there are such things as coming to grips with questions of gender and sexuality, proper use of pronouns. Uh, just this morning, if you perhaps saw, the governor of North Dakota signed a special bill saying teachers did not have to use requested pronouns. Questions around how to use technology, how to respond fairly to the different cultural needs of one's students. And add to this, by the way, an acknowledged a uh, genuine crisis in student mental health. And if that all weren't enough, in the few months since chat GPT and other AI things have appeared, there's been a debate about what, what that's going to mean for the future of the academic profession. 
Finally, lastly, in just yesterday's Chronicle of Higher Education, the Bible of today's academic life in the US, there's an article about attempts in Florida and Texas to legislate a ban on diversity statements and also abolish tenure. According to the article, this has had such a chilling effect on job applicants that even people who have been offered good positions in those states and have no other options have turned down the jobs. As you can probably figure, the words, the American University, covers a good deal of territory, some of it genuinely scary, and at the very least, an attempt featuring something like an educational coup. And the right would like nothing so much as to forge an equivalence between left and right forces, claiming, for example, that diversity, equity, and inclusion policies and trigger warnings pose a grave danger. So there's a huge amount of conflict. So the question is, with all this stuff going on, do I still want to go ahead and find some ways in which the American system might be a good model for the future? Um, I was actually thinking of stopping right there, but I, I will go on uh, and try to do this. Uh, to set this up, uh, I'll give you, even though some of you do know me, I, I'll briefly try to give you my own bona fides so you'll know something about my experience and, and where I'm coming from when I talk about this. And then I'll touch on some of the central conflicts and approaches and what they mean. And I'll conclude with what is very much an outsider's view of what might be useful for your system here, but only a bit of that. So I grew up uh, in the university, and that makes me both an ideal commentator and also somewhat suspect. Uh, as we know, as a rule, outsiders understand nothing because, well, they're on the outside. And insiders understand nothing because they're much too close to really get it. So even though we tend to think of the margins and the marginalized as disenfranchised, there's some truth to the notion that the margins are actually the best vantage point uh, to see into a system. Uh, what's that guy's name? Um, Oh, Kafka, yeah, well, so in this talk, I'll try to be both insider and outsider if I can. My insider qualifications, both my parents were university professors in theater and poetry and drama, and the life of the university uh, followed and filled my home as I was growing up. Students and faculty came over for everything from informal visits to cocktail parties, I was only allowed to come down occasionally to serve little hot dogs at the cocktail parties. <clears throat> but there was a, a, nothing so exciting as the many times student actors came after a show to have a post-show critique with high energy and probing self-examinations. Well, my outsider qualifications, I'm afraid, is that I decided to study Czech music uh, instead of something that my professors wanted, which was either Beethoven sketches or Renaissance music. Uh, my experience as a teacher spans both the Ivy Leagues, Columbia University, some lesser known schools in New York, such as Hofstra, Fordham, and Mercy College, where I taught one summer in a shopping mall. Uh, and uh, also, I've taught at the University of Chicago, an Ivy League wannabe, a wealthy private university in the Midwest, Washington University, a state school with its own beach, that's UC Santa Barbara, <clears throat> and now I work in one of relatively few American universities without a traditional campus, that's NYU. I also taught for several years in England at the University of Lancaster, and of course, briefly at Charles University, and then at NYU's Abu Dhabi and Shanghai campuses, and of course at NYU Prague. And while it's easier to get to know the dark side of the moon than to master the university system of another country, at least I have a few handholds here and there and a little experience. Well, it's always a risk to say such things, but in hindsight, always 2020, as we know, the period from the 1950s to the early 2000s seems to me to have been part of the golden age of the American university in many ways. 
Although, to be fair, there are those who think of it as a period where higher education was oblivious to its own internal contradictions. But still, the institution was expanding throughout the post-war period, and even during my first years was still growing. You could be ambitious in terms of your research and publications and end up in one of the elite Ivy League schools or their non-Ivy counterparts, like the University of Chicago and Stanford and first-rate university systems, as I've mentioned, in states like California, Michigan, uh, uh, North Carolina, and New York were in the process of development. <clears throat> or you could be less ambitious and still get a position uh, teaching in one of the many liberal arts colleges, where, again, you could, with the blessing of the institution, focus more on research, on teaching than on research. And universities kept getting larger and more powerful, at least through the 1990s, with expansion fed by federal contracts, international programs, and in general, a near obsession among many parents in vying for the limited number of positions in top schools. Uh, the daughter of a friend of mine wrote a bestseller called Fat Envelope Frenzy, uh, because before the digital age, uh, if you got rejected from the university, you just got a simple envelope. But if you were accepted, you got a, a fat envelope. And, and there was a kind of frenzy around that. In 1950s, Clark Kerr, the president of the University of California, tried to forecast the future in words that articulated the powerful role that he felt the university should play. And this is a quote he said, what the railroads did for the second half of the last century and the automobile for the first half of this century may be done for the second half of this century by the knowledge industry. That is, to serve as a focal point for national growth and for the university to be the engine of growth it had to abandon any aspect of its monastic past and engage with the real world of commerce, defense, and politics. Of course, the development of Kerr's multiversity, uh, that was the term he used, which was, of course, echoed by Facebook's uh, or Meta's uh, metaverse. This was hardly uncontested, and famous disagreements erupted. <clears throat> Fifty years ago, Robert Nesbitt published a response to Kerr called The Degradation of Academic Dogma. On the one hand, Nesbitt felt that as organized research became a, a path to prestige and power, many became to view teaching as a lower status activity. On the other hand, he thought that too much involvement in terms of specific social issues would take up too much energy and because the university ultimately could not solve social problems, its activities in terms of teaching and research would ultimately be undermined and weakened. Uh, this is a quote from Nisbet. What is not honest or coherent is the view that we may have the university considered as an intellectual community founded on the rock of dispassionate reason and also have at one and the same time as part and parcel of the same scene the kinds of mission, activity, and role that have dominated the American university since World War II. So, you know, he said, can the university play its role, a serious, powerful role, as a kind of dispassionate force while at the same time uh, entering the world in every way? So these different views of the university, along with many others, have been competing over the last 50 years. In fact, they're being played out this moment in many places. For example, UC Berkeley, which is traditionally a place of, of uh, progressive ferment has moved to close its anthropology library for financial reasons, and there's been a sit-in there for several weeks. The library has been a place that epitomizes Nesbitt's view of a university as a scholarly community where equals come together to study, debate, discuss, and reflect. Closing the library will save, according to the university, $400,000, while critics of the plan <clears throat> note that the administration is spending half a billion dollars on a new data sciences center for artificial intelligence, data analytics, 
and machine learning. Well, then the question is, with all these kinds of things, what can we say the American university does well? Um, you'll understand again that this is a slanted perception reflecting my own views without certainly enough exposure to the situation here. But one thing I think we've been able to do, and maybe we'll continue, is to avoid evaluation metrics. The best American universities simply do not have systems like the UK and other countries that use metrics and algorithms to judge academic quality. While universities and fields as a whole, of course, have rigorous processes related to merit and promotion and publication, there's no national or even university-wide rating system. And again, the, the, this does involve a cost-benefit analysis. Nothing is all that simple. I understand that in an academic climate like England, where certain universities have dominated public perception, Oxford and Cambridge, an evaluation system that seems to demonstrate that certain departments in Southampton or Bristol are actually better than Oxbridge is, is salutary. But the exercise known in England as the REF takes enormous energy, costs a great deal of time and money, while of course the system can be and is gamed, and the results ultimately are not really objective. Further, because the stakes involved with state support are so great, it discourages risk-taking in favor of conservative thinking and research, and on the other side, even encourages puffed-up, preening news releases about the results. To sum this up in the words of one study, quote, a grand total of 32 vice chancellors have reportedly boasted in internal emails that their university has become a top 10 UK university based on the recent results. There are reasons, of course, again, why all this bureaucracy is unnecessary. There's a peer review system in place for publications, a journal, an academic press. Rigorous peer review is done by experts in the field, something that can't be duplicated by some central committee who have to function as generalists. And there's a sense in the US that for the most part, the university with all its problems can be trusted to be a self-evaluating system. Sure, there's fakery. We all know people who pretend to know everything. Even though treating faculty as adults, well, has its risks, uh, the risk is that without oversight, there are no consequences for laziness and incompetence. For most of us, this kind of trust allows for a nuance and freedom that are part of what contributes to important new work. And there are penalties. A colleague of mine was interviewing for an entry level position at the University of Chicago, and he was being a little bit cute, and he said to the dean, well, what if after I get tenure, I stop publishing? And the dean looked at him and said, you will become invisible. Um, so another thing is differences in professional style. Again, perhaps as a non-European, I'm naive, but I'm aware of certain national university cultures where someone called a professor acts as if and is expected to act as if they know everything. This always makes me giggle uh, because I really can't think of anything I really know or, or less modestly that the attempt to know anything is, is harder than one can ever imagine. Um, and there are many sins and I'm sure I'm guilty of many of them but I do think the worst thing in the academy is to pretend to know stuff that no one really knows. First, because it's dishonest and second, because you simply become a poor investigator. I do think there is more of a, what I would call a wisdom of crowds tradition at the best American universities. That is, the smartest person in the room is the room, uh, rather than a single person in it. Uh, whether it's a science lab with everything from undergrads to Nobel Prize winners, or a graduate seminar in theater history, the collaborative, non-hierarchical side of American higher education is, I believe, worth emulating. And I know that many uh, faculty at this institution do, or maybe they did it without even thinking of uh, the so-called American style. 
And although, of course, many American scholars uh, use archives and documents, uh, not as much as certain other national traditions, which act as if, if, if it's not about the documents, uh, one shouldn't even talk about it. So speculation is considered an amateurish activity uh, in certain kinds of academic cultures. And I think in the United States, at best, there is a really good balance between using archives and documents on the one hand and being willing to try to dream up new approaches and theories. So, um, academic style and theory. So I personally find the number and varieties of theories used in American universities endless, baffling, sometimes frustrating and pretentious and often fascinating and often all of those together. And you could certainly say that the humanities and the social sciences in the US are deeply entwined with a range of theoretical approaches. In fact, uh, younger scholars today going for a job interview have to be prepared generally to make statements about their views on an experience with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it would not be strange for them to be asked about what theory they subscribe to. I'll try to answer this question of theory in both a roundabout and a personal way. So if you asked me, I couldn't describe myself in terms of any of the most popular theories currently in use. In other words, I'm not a queer theorist or a feminist. I don't do post-colonial theory. I'm not a Marxist critic, a deconstructionist, or a Lacanian. I'm skeptical about theories of power emanating from Foucault, and I'm neither Freudian, Jungian, or an evolutionary psychologist. But a few nights ago, I was in Besedny Doom in Brno, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the hall, watching a reenactment of Janacek's 1892 ethnographic concert, which included four musicians from Chodzko alternating and sometimes playing along with the Philharmonie Brno. Several of the sections of the concert involved Janacek's choral arrangements for SATB choir, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Men on one side of the stage, women on the other. At one point, while singing Troiki, one of the women started swaying back and forth as she sang, and I don't know whether this was planned, but the rest of the women singers followed. And as I watched and, and, and listened to this, I couldn't help wonder about issues of sound and gender, performativeness and power. I also wondered why, if women's voices are at most naturally about an octave higher than men's voices, and some of that may be cultural, why does so much singing have them separated by two octaves or more? Were these singers performing, being village women, or did the music itself somehow force them into being more gendered, more womanized because of the high range? In particular, were they reenacting what many would call the subservient and relatively powerless position of women in the society that produced the music? Now, the point is whether I'm right or wrong, either in any conclusion I might reach or, or in considering it, but whether it's useful to think in such terms. And I can say a few things. First, my level of enthusiasm for the performance was so great that it would be impossible to argue that curiosity about gender issues, say, had diminished the power of the concert for me. If anything, it was the opposite. Further, since, properly speaking, proponents of high culture reject the notion that a concert is pure entertainment, it forces us to ask just what a concert might be for. And we have to admit, we don't exactly know. But one of the things a concert might be for is an arena in which to wonder about how such things as choirs might play into the perpetuation of certain gender norms. And I say this again as somebody who, forgive the bad pun, has no skin in the game. I don't have a particular ideology I'm looking to validate unless what I hope, even though I understand the notion of bias, I hope that open-minded curiosity is the ideology. And then going on in the concert, there was the question of just what Janáček, with his own passion for something like authenticity, 
thought he was doing by bringing folk music into the bourgeois space of the concert hall in many arrangements, which, remember, this is early Janacek, sounded kind of soporific, especially next to the real folk musicians. And I think he must have realized that. He must have realized there was a possibility that these folk musicians, with their bracing intonations, with their incredible volume, volume of sound, four singers twice as loud as the orchestra, and almost unnotatable rhythms that Janáček might, might have realized that this was undermining his own work. And in my fantasy, I think Janáček knew that could be one of the outcomes, and he took the risk. And I think that's the risk we all take when we really interrogate the things we think we know. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that you need to be at an American university to have such thoughts just that I had them, not because I was preparing for this talk, but because in my life at NYU, I'm surrounded by many different kinds of thinking about reality. And of course, I just can't help trying out these ideas on things I encounter. And again, I think this is one of the strengths of the American University in 2023. It's a risky ferment of ideas and approaches. Because I'm at the Faculty of Philosophy here, and because I'm a music historian, I'd like to say a few things about the state of the humanities before coming to a conclusion. And I think some of those issues may be pertinent here. You can read daily in US papers, uh, newspapers, and specialty publications about the falling number of students engaged in the traditional activities of the humanities. And there are questions about the relevance of such things as languages, music, philosophy, and literature as ends in themselves. And at the same time, the endless theorizing, the creation of new terms and concepts has resulted in what one commentator castigated as, quote, the inability or lack of desire of humanists to speak directly to the public in a language they can understand. Before going on, I'd like to try to clarify two things. First, because of the power of interdisciplinarity in many fields, it's not easy to distinguish humanistic from social scientific research uh, these days or articulate precisely what these constructs mean. So the current chair of my music department at NYU got a PhD in anthropology uh, and is an ethnomusicologist, but wrote a book on black women rockers which won the book prize in the American Musicological Society, which is a humanistic society. And the book, of course, uses, draws on traditional social science, uh, anthropological concepts of ethnography, but also in, is engaged with historical and archival work as well. <clears throat> Second, we may note, and this is perhaps more peculiar to, to music, that this thing called the arts, is sometimes included with the humanities and sometimes not. Sometimes it's assumed the arts are included when one says humanities, but other times you'll hear arts and humanities, implying that they're related but different. And finally, you'll find places where the two are entirely separate, where arts is done on th this side of the campus and uh, you know humanities on the other side. Now maybe it's because I'm a musician again, but I actually think it's worth trying to figure all of this out, especially because in academia 2023, there is a pervasive notion that the only way to know the world is by reading books and articles with footnotes. Thus, the question of what role the arts, and by this I mean music, theater, visual arts, new media, what role the arts play in the humanities has metaphorical value by insisting that valuable knowledge emerges from work that can be entirely nonverbal or in which the verbal is combined with movement or images. Now, one of the problems is the old saw, right? They say about many things. Um, we know what it is when you do not ask, but when you ask, we cannot say. And this is true about the value of the humanities. 
like the bad movie summaries you see online. You know, you try to decide which movie to watch and you see uh, a woman gets into trouble with drugs and meets a pop star who helps. You know, you don't want to have anything to do with that movie even if it might be good. Uh, when people talk about the value of humanities, it usually falls flat. They say, human humanities are natural to humans and necessary for the good of complex and quick changing society. Or, the humanities contribute to social and individual happiness and well-being. It's a way of understanding the human holistically. Or, through studying the humanities, one has the opportunity to get to know oneself and others better. Such advocacies are often coupled with the argument that, well, the best use or value of the humanities is its uselessness. Uh, this is perhaps parallel to the idea that what makes art or art activity so significant is that people don't need to do them or they're not strictly necessary for survival. Well, we could quibble and say, what does necessary for survival actually mean? And the usefulness of the useless downplays real notions of actual and practical value in the humanities. Of course, trying to figure out just what humanities means is a full-time job. One could review, think of it uh, as just simply a group of departments in a university. But on the other side of the spectrum, it can refer actually to a mode of thinking and investigating, an approach that sets its sights on really difficult issues and problems without expecting always to get a clear material answer. In fact, maybe even not wanting one. I'm being facetious, but um, it reminds me a little of the TV detective Columbo. Uh, and you know, Columbo, it's always, he's a mess, and um, everybody thinks that the problem's been solved and they're ready to shut everything down, and he goes, ah, just, just one more question. And, and I think, you know, for me, that's a metaphor for the humanities. Just when people are comfortable that we really understand this, it's all settled, somebody comes along and says, one, one more question. One more question. That's the humanist uh, who asks the vexing question that reveals the reality that we almost always know less than we think we do. So this version of the humanities, which I think is alive and well in many places in the American university and elsewhere, believes that all questions are naughty. You're always missing something. And while violence towards the vulnerable may be highest on the list of prohibitions, intellectual pretension is also high on that list. Now, none of this is so cut and dry. And as we've suggested, there are many arguments that echo Havel, the usefulness of the useless. One of them may be teased out perhaps by thinking about connections between the basic sciences and clinical science. One would never say that abstract mathematical or scientific processes are actually useless, even though they might never impact an actual human being. And we can note that enough money is spent every day on failed scientific experiments to fund the humanities all over the world for a decade. Um, now, my wife has been both a basic and clinical scientist in the field of high-risk OBGYN obstetrics. Uh, in the latter, she deals with intricate details in the lives of real patients. So as a clinician, she saves lives, she helps people reach an equilibrium in their state of health. As a research scientist, she looks at ribosomal proteins and T cells and has nothing to do with pregnant women. She doesn't help anyone. Years ago, Umberto Eco wrote about visiting the Everglades theme park, where you're always guaranteed to see the crocodile, whereas if you visit the actual Everglades, you might not see the crocodile. So in her clinical guise, my wife is always guaranteed to help humanity. In the basic sciences, who knows? Decades of research can possibly lead nowhere but it would be inappropriate to call such activity useless. And of course, it's my view that something similar exists in our own fields. Certain kinds of creative and intellectual activity that might seem abstract or irrelevant or arcane can lead in unexpected and genuinely progressive directions. In any event, the best case that one can make for the humanities is to simply continue to do really exciting work in it. 
Now, I won't insult anyone by adding another placard saying, the humanities are best equipped to help us navigate a changing world, but we might note a possible seismic shift that could soften, perhaps, the disproportionate energy and money going to these STEM fields. And this is more family business. After getting a PhD in material science, my son decided to leave that field and do a boot camp in big data. After just a few months of this, he was able to get a job with a startup company in Chicago. Now, I visited this company and was really blown away. It was my first experience with a Google-style campus. Huge kitchen with free food of every kind, fancy coffee shop, vats filled with your favorite candy, an enormous airplane hangar-sized workroom with swings, you charged your phone by riding a stationary bike, and many, many video game consoles because the CEO of the company believed that video games increase creativity. Moreover, there was a spirit of camaraderie. They even had after-work clubs until they started cutting back, and then the clubs didn't last very long. But my son kept his job and eventually moved to Facebook or Meta doing AI, artificial intelligence. Well, this seemed perfect. Another great team. When his wife became ill, Facebook behaved like a family-run company, telling him to take whatever time he needed. And then a few weeks ago, at 8 a.m. in the morning, he got an email telling him he could keep his job. Sadly, several of his coworkers got the 7 a.m. email, which told them they no longer had jobs part of the 10,000 people laid off by Meta, and a reasonable percentage of the 168,000 tech workers laid off already in 2023. And so the idea of tech and all these hot things as a safe harbor was shattered as the multi-billionaire Mark Zuckerberg justified the move by saying that this was the year of efficiency. In other words, with the rapid shifts going on, there's no guarantee that STEM is your savior, and perhaps more than ever, that a solid degree in the humanities is a good investment wherever you are. The former president of NYU, John Sexton, used to speak about endowments that were in a sense worth billions even though they did not represent a single dollar in the bank. One of these was what he called a locational endowment, that NYU's presence in the city of New York, Greenwich Village, uh, was important, that students came to NYU because of the city, and the character of the institution is to some extent shaped by it. In my own experience, the Czech Republic has an absolutely unique locational endowment in the center of Europe with an astonishingly rich historical context a tradition of inquiry and excellence in the sciences, linguistics and philosophy, the arts and the humanities. While some cities like Prague and Brno have been able to exploit that in some ways, my experience is that there are many other cities in the Czech Republic, Pardubice, Pilsen, Olomots, which are also places of glorious potential. And there's no reason why, with proper support and thoughtful management, these universities can't go from being in the top 500 or the top 1,000 to being in the top 50 of world universities. The second kind of endowment stressed by Sexton was a matter of attitude, what he called the special blend of creativity, entrepreneurship, cooperation, striving, and dedication captured in the phrase common enterprise. Well, it doesn't take a lot to figure out that if faculty members feel undervalued by a system that pays them far too little and doesn't give them workloads comparable to the best universities, they won't be able to compete or won't want to. So when I hear and see, looking at all the salary figures, that a wealthy European country like this one allots such poor salaries for academics, which one of my colleagues correctly described as alarming, particularly targeting the humanities sector, I simply have to scratch my head and wonder what people are thinking. The Czech Republic, of course, must count its traditions of inquiry, intellectual ambition, and artistic brilliance as international jewels. It would be a pity 
if in the headlong rush to support science and technology, the humanities and the social sciences were neglecting, forcing a brain drain that would effectively end centuries of positive activity. I began with my Dickensian invocation from the tale of two cities about the best of times and the worst of times. And if we were to consider those two cities to be Prague and New York, we can find parallels and divergences. On the one hand, the American university seems threatened by some of the very ideas that emerged from it. For example, and this is only a slight oversimplification, the idea that the whole concept of merit must be questioned because it emerged from the patriarchy. It was a feature of white supremacy. And this, not only in the fuzzy humanities, but in the hard sciences. On the other hand, the university is also the right place to ask and try to answer such uncomfortable questions. For example, whether even what we call the scientific truth is the same for all people. An article in last week's New York Times begins with the question, is a gay Republican Latino more capable of conducting a physics experiment than a white progressive heterosexual woman? Would they come to different conclusions based on the same data because of their different backgrounds? Well, the authors of the article said no, but the 1789 responses to the article, some in support and some angrily denouncing it, are also part of the strength of the system that kind of attempt to find some truth in difference and different ideas. Earlier in my remarks, I asked, what is a classical concert for? And my answer was, it's hard to say. And of course, the same is true for the question, what is a university for? One of the best answers was given by my college economics professor, Lynn Turgeon. Tongue in cheek, he said, well, the purpose of college is to keep students out of the job market for four years, artificially lowering unemployment figures. So for example, today in the US, there are 5.7 million unemployed, leading to an unemployment rate of 3.4%. If you were to add the 18 million college students to the mix, you'd have more than 10% of the country jobless. But perhaps that's uh, too prosaic an answer one probably still too glib, but more to the point, is that a university is a place that tries to puzzle out the very problems it creates. For this, the faculty does not have to be revered, but it needs to be respected. And one of the ways to show respect is by rewarding the years of training it takes to achieve high goals in the humanities and social sciences with salaries that are worthy of both the people who receive them and the broad national culture that supports them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike for a very inspiring talk. And uh, there is a time for questions, Please, I, hope so. I hope. So if you have questions, just give a sign and I will pass the microphone. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning the idea of slow uh, science, if you can maybe comment on that, because I think we've been uh, struggling a lot with uh, the demands of fast science, and I know that in the US, I think the science is a little slower, or at least in the humanities, you don't have to push so hard to have the first and second and third book and whatnot. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, you know, this whole uh, movement of uh, going back to slow science in the university. Do you mean the slow pace of research? Slow pace of research and slow pace of, slower pace of publication. Yeah. Well, you know, there's that movie, um, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? 
and it, it takes place during the Depression, and, and one of the things that they feature is, is one of these contests where you have to sort of walk around a track, you're not allowed to run, and of course everybody starts walking slowly, but little by little they keep getting ahead of each other, and eventually they're practically running, and so, you know, I mean, one thing I didn't talk about, and again, there, there are a lot of things to cover, is a, a certain kind of paranoia um, among young faculty in the American system. So they, they, they want to show up and know very quickly what is expected of them in, in, in no uncertain terms. And I don't think they would believe or trust anybody who said, take your time. It's more like what they say in New York delicatessens, take your time and hurry up. Um, and I think, so I, I think there is a theoretical understanding that pushing everybody so hard to, I mean, I, I, I may have told you this, but when I was at Washington University, we had a dean who called the entire young faculty together and had a cigar and he pointed to all of us and said, none of you are gonna get tenure. And so we would joke when people asked what we were working on, what kind of research we were doing, and we would say, oh, we're much too busy publishing to do research. Um, and, and so, you know, there is a sense that that, that happens, that there's a push. W on the other hand, you know, what, those of us who are musicians, e even if we're, or musicologists, even if not even on the best day of our lives we, would we consider ourselves to be in Bach's league, um, you know, we know that he managed to turn out a, a cantata every two weeks for quite some time, and there didn't seem to be a loss of quality. So on the one hand, there's no proof that publishing quickly and efficiently um, is a bad thing. But I think many people would like to give more of an option. And, and, and as long as I'm on, on that role, I would say that what happens that instead of allowing uh, young faculty to play a role in the lives of students in a more informal and intimate way, um, it, it, it's all very regimented. In, in other words, one thing, I, I was um, giving a talk in Texas and I landed at the airport, I had to take a taxi for about 45 minutes and the guy who picked me up you know, I, I mean, he looked to me like a redneck, you know, guy didn't seem, I didn't, didn't know if he'd gone to high school, but when we started talking, there was another example of how you shouldn't judge people by the way they look. He went on and on about how he'd gone to the University of Washington and that he had a couple of professors who he would visit in their offices and talk to them. And what an honor and a privilege was and how transformative it was in his life to be able to have that, well, you know, the pressures of American universities for junior faculty make it very hard for them to have those kinds of more casual, informal relationships, which Nesbitt would say, that, that's what the university was supposed to be. Um, but, but I, I, you know, and I'm very much a proponent of this slower science, but, you know, nobody wants to get caught being the slow scientist who doesn't get promoted or hired because they're too slow. So, but, yeah. I don't think I had a question, actually, but a couple of comments. First of all, this is the first official talk I have heard Mike Beckerman give that wasn't about music, but uh, he didn't disappoint me. It was, it was stimulating and informative, as always, uh, which is no surprise, given the way Mike is and all the rich experience he's had with universities. Um, one detail, when at the beginning Mike was talking a lot about salaries, how much people make, just to make sure you understand those are annual salaries. I, I point that out because right. here the salaries are usually given in income per month, but in America it's per year. So the salaries are high, but they're not quite as high as you might have thought if you thought it was, it was uh, per the month. And, uh, oh, about uh, the need to, the feeling that we need to display our knowledge instead of actually questioning that knowledge. Uh, I had some bad experiences myself uh, along that, those lines in my graduate uh, education when I remember 
after attending a few seminars, and I, I was getting kind of a strange feeling, and one of my fellow students, who was more experienced, said, you know, the students who attend these seminars, they really go there not to learn something, but to show what they already know. <laughs> and there was, <laughs> there was quite a bit of that. Nevertheless, I learned a few things, too. Um, and, uh, oh, woke. I mean, I don't think there's a Czech word for woke. Uh, but do you know what woke is? <laughs> it's, new, it's new in English, too. I mean, it, but it's a, it's a big deal in American, you know, well, in American life these days, isn't it? Woke. Well, woke, woke started by being considered a positive thing by the people who were using the word. Woke meant that you were, well, uh, sensitive oh. to and alert to structural inequities in, in the country. Uh, and, and again, it, it, uh, it's part of a whole range of studies um, uh, around critical race theory um, and, and questions of, of, of white supremacy and structure. And it, it has many different sides to it. Um, it is a theory, it's not a fact, but it, it does raise these questions. And I suppose at, a, at its most benevolent, instead of blaming individuals for racism, um, it, it views the way the country itself was set up to benefit one group of people at the expense of another. And, and so, you know, th so this is a, a, something that is going on in the university, it's being contested. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a, always a question, you know. So science would never claim to get everything right, but they would tend to think that we get everything right eventually. In other words, there was a famous case of uh, a couple of researchers at the University of Utah claiming that they had achieved cold fusion in the lab. And for a while, this seemed astonishing, like it could be the future of power and everything, and their results seemed okay, and it didn't seem as if, but eventually, over a couple of years, it became clear that they couldn't duplicate their experiments. And so there is a way in which, even though people get very alarmed, oh my God, look what they're doing in American universities, in one land, that there is some sense that this will be a kind of self-balancing system. That there, there are people, when it goes too far, people who you wouldn't expect, people you would think would be on the left progressive end, will say, well, let's slow this down. Let's think about this. Um, you know, there are African-American scholars who feel unsure about what they call Afro-pessimism, which is seeing the entire black experience in America solely through the eyes of oppression and slavery and wanting to celebrate. So there, you know, you'll get competing views. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there is that. About salaries, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's a tricky one because they are yearly salaries. And, um, you know, as, as anyone knows, uh, salaries go further in Omaha, Nebraska than they do in New York City. Um, and uh, the price of real estate in cities like Prague, New York, London, uh, make the academic life very challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, I think universities that are serious try to find ways to, to address that. But it, it's sometimes quite hard to address. Could you, uh, could you address the concept of university as a safe space, for one, and for second, since you deal with music, how is it with so-called cultural appropriation? I'm sorry, I didn't, couldn't fix the sound system. All right, I'll try to, first of all, university as a safe space. Yeah, well, right. Well, you could say to the first, um, whose safe space? 
And, and then you have competing, you know, I mean, what, what happens, of course, is that these certain things erupt and they get a lot of attention. As you may have noticed in any country, um, you don't sell newspapers by just bland stories, so they will love to fasten on these stories. But, well, there was the case where an art historian showed a, you know, after many warnings and so-called trigger warnings, showed a painting that had Muhammad in it and a student claimed to have been deeply hurt by it and went to the administration. It, I don't know how it eventually ended. The teacher may have been fired. Um, and there are, there are moments like that. And they've been happening for years. Uh, one of my most well-known colleagues, who I won't name her name, who is a spectacular teacher, uh, oh, for generations, everybody revered this person. She could walk into the classroom and they'd applaud practically the first class. One class she walked into and started talking and it had people from all over the world and suddenly she had to defend herself. Why is a, a white lady telling us all about Latin America and Africa? And, and so, you know, this can, this can happen to anyone at any time. Um, one of the questions always is, does the university have your back? Uh, and that's answered equivocally. There's been something in recent weeks where several university presidents have tried to reaffirm the principle, their idea of the principle of free speech, saying that we're not going to curtail things, we're not going to have trigger warnings, where you, know, you come to a university for robust discussion, um, and then there are others who say, look, that the problem in the American university system now isn't that there are a couple of people maybe making trouble or raising questions about things like this, but the fact that Republican governors like DeSantis want to take over the university system and, and have it follow his views of what should be taught. Things like appropriation, um, again, this is... Maybe it's picked up speed, but this is something that's been going along for quite a while. And I suppose, you know, somebody could, I mean, even though American and, and Czech history is not this sort of hotly contested space that, say, African American history is, somebody could say that, you know, what am I, you know who are you to study Czech music? Um, it belongs to the, you know, so this uh, question of, by the way, I couldn't help but notice, you'll have to forgive me, that there was a, a book with uh, Czech musicologists in it, a new book, right, with who, and, and David Beveridge wasn't in it, which seemed ridiculous to me. How could, so in other words, um, you know, Czech turns out not to have a word like American, right? Because anybody who comes becomes American citizen, they're an American. You don't say, oh, they're an Italian-American, right? But I don't think Czech has a word for somebody. Or if you use the word Czech, it means ethnic Czech, right? Uh, which seemed funny because, like, if, if, if David's not a Czech musicologist, I don't know who is. Um, so, so but, but these ideas of who, I mean, even though it's nothing compared to the kinds of issues that Daniel may be referring to, uh, it's, it's a question of who controls it, who belongs and then who has the right to have insider information or do certain things. I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeless because I really do think that everything starts with the way individuals behave. And it's important for people who believe that you should be able to ask questions about anything to stand up for what they believe in and like everybody else who has stood up for what they believed in in, in com uncomfortable times, sometimes you take your knocks. Um, but but if, if nobody says anything, then it, it, it can become like a, 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 a bad gravity where nobody feels as if they can speak openly. And I think for the, for, for the ship to steer best, I think there has to be that. Um, and again, uh, you know, it's just, the other thing I would say in answer to Daniel is that sometimes people engage in what you Czechs call provokatze, right? Sometimes people are writing stuff that's provocation. 
And you can't respond to it as if it wasn't provocation. You're playing into the hands of the people who are trying to provoke you. Um, and, and often, many of these provocations, they can have to do with gender or race, um, involve thinking or theories where one third of it seems to make perfect sense. It's smart and it's interesting. One third of it is take it or leave it, and another third of it is crazy. Um, and, and again, so you have, you know, it, it, takes, it takes all of our uh, mental energy these days to really think through how we're going to respond to the different kinds of things that are happening in universities. You've probably followed that maybe the most um, sort of excitable and uh, unsettling fights now are about transgender issues, whether it's the politics um, of, of right-wing people who are trying to shut down access to surgery, not only for, for, for minors, but for everybody, or, or whether it's seemingly well-meaning people who want to learn by discussing something and finding out that the very act of trying to discuss it is considered unacceptably hurtful by a group of people. And that it creates a kind of impasse that's not easy to get out of. Uh, Mike, thanks again for the great talk. Uh, I, I, will, I will ask you about something very, you know, m much simpler and closer to our everyday experience as I think it's going to come in the next couple of months, and that's uh, artificial intelligence you mentioned. And I think a lot of people think like, well, this is something we'll have to be dealing with in the future, but I recently had an experience. I was walking in a class. We were supposed to read a paper, and there was another student. I won't give the name. And that student was sitting uh, next to me with their computer open and uh, said, well, I didn't, I didn't get down to reading the paper. So open jet, chat GPT, typed in, can you summarize in one paragraph what this uh, paper is about? And I was skeptical. It's just going to be complete nonsense, right? It was, it was about right. Mm -hmm. So in this way, of course, the student hurt themselves because they didn't do uh, the homework. But of course, you know, in a matter of, I think, months, uh, we will be in the situation where some people will think that kind of like these shortcuts are, you know, a good way how to, uh, you know, make their studies um, uh, easier to uh, finish, I don't know. Uh, so what do you think are the uh, opportunities that uh, usage of the technology has and where do you think the th threats are and how to, you know, prevent them, uh, let's say, you know, uh, in, in the example that I've given? Thanks. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, somebody who's spent a lot of time looking into to that. I mean, I've read a few articles and talked to people about it. Um, you know, it, it really depends on trajectory, right? Because, you know, in the old days, um, any decent chess player could beat a computer. And then the computer started getting better and better and giving them some good games. And then now computers can beat anybody. So, you know, if, if AI follows that trajectory in certain areas, well, I mean, you could consider it good or bad. I'm sure it has a million uses. Um, but it, it's, you know, some of it's a little bit like any wiki thing. So, for example, if you use a translation program um, in a language like Czech or Hungarian um, that people use a lot, then it, it self-educates machine learning, right? Whereas if you use, I mean, I, I find that when I try to do something with German and French, that's pretty terrible because I think much fewer people use them and for different kinds of things. So, I, you know, I, I think people are concerned about, um, you know, now, now there's a lot of what we call AI chat GPT hallucinations. So, you know, you ask chat GPT to, to talk about, you know, Schubert and, 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 and the Czech past, and then you'll get a beautifully written essay about how, um, you know, Sch uh, Schubert was influenced by Dvorak and Smetna, and it will tell you what pieces of Schubert were influenced by Dvorak and Smetna, even though, of course, it's chronologically ridiculous. 
Um, but I'd have to say nobody really knows. I mean, clearly people are investing in this. Uh, things didn't happen the way they, we thought they would happen. I mean, I have a, a close friend who's always on doing the new, new thing. He was one of the people who at IBM um, invented three-dimensional printing. You know, the, when you need a little part for your thing, you just, you know, out, out pops the plastic. Um, and he, ten, more than 10, 15 years ago, said, oh, in five years there are going to be self-driving cars. Well, you know, they did have, try them out, and there were a bunch of accidents and a bunch of people got killed, and now we don't know what's going on with self-driving cars. So I think these kinds of things will go by fits and starts, and as usual, the news media will focus on, on particular things. Um, yeah, I, I think for scholars it could be a little bit dangerous um, in the sense that uh, we all know that even though a lot has been digitized, you know, there's a million things that haven't been digitized. And if you were to start to believe that by commanding the digital universe you could have access to all the sources you need, you'd be in big trouble as a scholar. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess you could say that eventually, you know, in a hundred years, may, but still, no, you're not going to find everything and you still have to do the same kinds of things. So I think it can be very seductive uh, in various ways. I mean, I could think of, you know, catastrophic scenarios where, you know, <laughs> sends bombs off in the wrong direction or crashes stock markets. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a tricky time. Um, but we'll, you know, the, the good news is, I suppose we'll all live decades long enough to see how some of these things play out and are answered. But I don't know, other people may have some strong ideas uh, about that. I, I think it's probably already uh, put translators out of business. You know, I mean, really. Um, and it's getting better and better. So all these programs, you know, what's going to happen to to that whole field of translation. Uh, if, if, if you can get a really good translation just by pushing a button. Any more? Have I tired everyone out? So, Professor, uh, in the, uh, you know, on the poster, uh, the subtitle of your the subtitle of your uh, lecture today is is the American University in 2023 a good model? And maybe it's me. I kind of maybe missed the point. Can you just summarize it? Is it a good model for others to follow, or is it totally screwed up? Well, I I, I mean I I tried to to be fair and point out ways in which it was really problematic, but I also tried to point out ways in which the kind of, of uh, intellectual and political ferment that is going on in, in universities can be extremely stimulating, that even though, of course, there's respect for authority, um, there are traditions for American higher education that are more collaborative and more informal, at least on the surface, than you find in other places. Now, I may have too rosy an idea of the science laboratory, uh, but my wife was in several laboratories around the country. And it did seem to me that even though, okay, to be honest, there was a, usually a kind of alpha, uh, often an alpha male, who was uh, getting the grant money and running the lab, that the lab was very democratic. Everybody was on a first name basis. There was no formality in dress. Um, the only people who wore suits and ties were drug salesmen, uh, people working for pharmaceutical companies. Um, that it, it could be, again, uh, you, you, there'd be a lab meeting and there would be a Nobel Prize winner and there'd be the head of the lab, a bunch of full professors, assistant professors, adjuncts, graduate students, and, and, and undergraduates. And the person who got to win the field was the person who had the best idea. And it didn't matter necessarily who it was. Now, of course, I, you know, people's egos don't vanish, but there was a, that kind of tradition 
of, of kind of really collaborative, I think which allowed uh, American science to become so successful. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's uh, emulated in, in many places to instead of a much more hierarchical where the professor is always right, the head is always right, that there, there, there's a much up and down. And, and I do think that there is that tradition in American academics, um, which I want to preserve. Um, in other words, rather than being dictated to by the latest political theory, uh, and to keep, to keep that sense of openness and collaboration. And I do understand this battle that's being fought between groups of people who claim, and nobody thinks they're making it up, that certain kinds of points of view or speech are hurtful to them, considering their backgrounds, where they come from, their experience. On the one hand, to respect that, and on the other hand, to do whatever you can to encourage this kind of really open discussion um, I mean, I, I, I can't see it other than a risk-reward world. And if you're not willing to take risks, one of the main risks being advertising yourself as an idiot, um, then you, you know, the likelihood of you getting places uh, is, in, in a really original and fresh way is, is slim. If there are no more questions, uh, if I may, probably the last very short one. Please. Uh, what would you suggest or uh, wish to Czech Academia for the future? Well, um, well, I mean, obviously, I I, w I would wish that the people who make decisions about salaries and, and payment and compensation uh, come to the same understanding that I have about the historic and present value of the humanities and the social sciences here. But from what I can see, even some of the salaries in the sciences and, and in other areas aren't very high. And, and that in order to, you know, again, if there's this idea that all the solutions are going to come from tech and tech is going to, you know, of course, then why wouldn't a country sort of hedge their bets? Why wouldn't Berkeley close the anthropology library and put up a half billion dollar artificial intelligence center? But um, since, as I, I suggested, I, I think the god of tech uh, has, has seen a bunch of knocks in, in the last couple of years and there's no guarantee it's going to recover. Um, that something like the, the university and the humanities, especially that have been around for centuries, uh, really need to be nourished. So of course what I'd like to see are people in the government understanding that and understanding that this is, even though of course there's a pie and everybody has to divide it, that this is a wealthy country. Um, and it, it, you know, particularly in comparison with many places in the world. And, supporting higher education and the people who have really given their lives to it is, is, a, is critically important. Um, and again, I don't want to evade specifics because one can always get nailed by specifics, but I, I would say that what's most important is for the Czech Academy to find its own path forward. But to understand that, that just as Sexton said, um, that NYU's path you know, had to do with its locational endowment and, and certain special things that it had and no one else had, that Czech universities are able to maximize those special circumstances, locations, and histories that, that mark it as, well, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to make a tired comparison with Czech music. Uh, because not all Czech music sounds Czech, nor does it, but th there is a tradition of something that's identifiable, that, that is at the same time on a, on a world international level also has a discrete and, and special identity. And I guess that's what I would wish for Czech universities as they develop. But they won't be able to do it unless they get the support they need from the government ministries. Thank you. Sure. Michael Beckerman.